some commendatory verses to volume one of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by expatriate in bangor maine don quixote volume one by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five some commendatory verses urganda the unknown to the book of don quixote of la mancha if to be welcomed by the good o book thou make thy steady aim no empty chatterer will dare to question or dispute thy claim but if perchance thou hast a mind to win of idiots approbation lost labor will be thy reward though they'll pretend appreciation they say a goodly shade he finds who shelters neath a goodly tree and such a one thy kindly star in behar bath provided thee a royal tree whose spreading boughs a show of princely fruit display a tree that bears a noble duke the alexander of his day of a munchigan gentleman thy purpose is to tell the story relating how he lost his wits or idle tales of love and glory of ladies arms and cavaliers a new orlando furioso inamorato rather who won dulcinea del toboso put no vain emblems on thy shield all figures that is bragging play a modest dedication make and give no scoffer room to say what alvaro de luna here or is it hannibal again or does king francis at madrid once more of destiny complain since heaven it hath not pleased on thee deep erudition to bestow or black latino's gift of tongues no latin let thy pages show ape not philosophy or wit lest one who cannot comprehend make a wry face at thee and ask why offer flowers to me my friend be not a meddler no affair of thine the life thy neighbours lead be prudent oft the random jest recoils upon the jester's head thy constant labour let it be to earn thyself an honest name for fooleries preserved in print are perpetuity of shame a further counsel bear in mind if that thy roof be made of glass it shows small wit to pick up stones to pelt the people as they pass win the attention of the wise and give the thinker food for thought who so indites frivolities will but by simpletons be sought amadis of gaul to don quixote of la mancha sonnet thou that didst imitate that life of mine when i in lonely sadness on the great rock pena pobre sat disconsolate in self-imposed penance there to pine thou whose sole beverage was the bitter brine of thine own tears and who withouten plate of silver copper tin in lowly state off the bare earth and on earth's fruits did stein live thou of thine eternal glory sure so long as on the round of the fourth sphere the bright apollo shall his coursers steer in thy renown thou shalt remain secure thy country's name in story shall endure and thy sage author stand without a peer don belianis of greece to don quixote of la mancha sonnet in slashing hewing cleaving word and deed i was the foremost knight of chivalry stout bold expert as e'er the world did see thousands from the oppressor's wrong i freed great were my feats eternal fame their meed in love i proved my truth and loyalty the hugest giant was a dwarf for me ever to knighthood's laws gave i good heed my mastery the fickle goddess owned and even chance submitting to control grasped by the forelock yielded to my will yet though above yon horned moon enthroned my fortune seems to sit great quixote still envy of thy achievements fills my soul the lady of oriana to dulcinea del toboso sonnet o oh, fairest dulcinea could it be it were a pleasant fancy to suppose so could miraflores change to el toboso and london's town to that which shelters thee oh could mine but acquire that livery of countless charms thy mind and body show so 
or him now famous grown thou madest him grow so thy knight in some dread combat could i see oh could i be released from amadis by exercise of such coy chastity as led thee gentle quixote to dismiss then would my heavy sorrow turn to joy none would i envy all would envy me and happiness be mine without alloy gandalin squire of amadis of gaul to sancho panza squire of don quixote sonnet all hail illustrious man fortune when she bound thee apprentice to the esquire trade her care and tenderness of thee displayed shaping thy course from misadventure free no longer now doth proud knight errantry regard with scorn the sickle and the spade of towering arrogance less count is made than of plain esquire like simplicity i envy thee thy dapple and thy name and those alforjas thou wast wont to stuff with comforts that thy providence proclaim excellent sancho hail to thee again to thee alone the ovid of our spain does homage with the rustic kiss and cuff from el donoso the motley poet on sancho panza and rocinante on sancho i am the esquire sancho pan who served don quixote of la man but from his service i retreat resolved to pass my life discreet for via diego called the sea maintained that only in reti was found the secret of well be according to the celesti a book divine except for sin by speech too plain in my opin on rocinante i am that rocinante fay great grandson of great barbier who all for being lean and bone had won don quixote for an own but if i matched him well in weak i never took short commons meek but kept myself in corn by steel a trick i learned from lasaril when with a piece of straw so neat the blind man of his wine he cheat orlando furioso to don quixote of la mancha sonnet if thou art not a peer peer thou hast none among a thousand peers thou art a peer nor is there room for one when thou art near unvanquished victor great unconquered one orlando by angelica undone am i o'er distant seas condemned to steer and to fame's altars as an offering bear valor respected by oblivion i cannot be thy rival for thy fame and prowess rise above all rivalry albeit both bereft of wits we go but though the scythian or the moor to tame was not thy lot still thou dost rival me love binds us in a fellowship of woe the knight of phoebus to don quixote of la mancha my sword was not to be compared with thine phoebus of spain marvel of courtesy nor with thy famous arm this hand of mine that smote from east to west as lightnings fly i scorned all empire and that monarchy the rosy east held out did i resign for one glance of claridiana's eye the bright aurora for whose love i pine a miracle of constancy my love and banished by her ruthless cruelty this arm had might the rage of hell to tame but gothic quixote happier thou dost prove for thou dost live in dulcinea's name and famous honoured wise she lives in thee from solistan to don quixote of la mancha sonnet your fantasies sir quixote it is true that crazy brain of yours have quite upset but aught of base or mean hath never yet been charged by any in reproach to you your deeds are open proof in all men's view for you went forth in justice to abate and for your pains sore drubbings did you get from many a rascally and ruffian crew if the fair dulcinea your heart's queen be unrelenting in her cruelty if still your woe be powerless to move her in such hard case your comfort let it be that sancho was a sorry go-between a booby he hard-hearted she and you no lover dialogue between babieca and rocinante sonnet how comes it rocinante you're so lean i'm underfed with overwork i'm worn but what becomes of all the hay and corn 
my master gives me none he's much too mean come come you show ill breeding sir i ween tis like an ass your master thus to scorn he is an ass will die an ass an ass was born why he's in love what's plainer to be seen to be in love is folly no great sense you're metaphysical from want of food rail at the squire then why what's the good i might indeed complain of him i grant ye but squire or master wears the difference they're both as sorry hacks as rocinante end the commendatory verses recording by expatriate in bangor maine author's preface and dedication to the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra this recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine the author's preface idle reader thou mayest believe me without any oath that i would this book as it is the child of my brain were the fairest gayest and cleverest that could be imagined but i could not counteract nature's law that everything shall beget its like and what then could this sterile ill-tilled wit of mine beget but the story of a dry shriveled whimsical offspring full of thoughts of all sorts and such as never came into any other imagination just what might be begotten in a prison where every misery is lodged and every doleful sound makes its dwelling tranquillity a cheerful retreat pleasant fields bright skies murmuring brooks peace of mind these are the things that go far to make even the most barren muses fertile and bring into the world births that fill it with wonder and delight sometimes when a father has an ugly loutish son the love he bears him so blindfolds his eyes that he does not see his defects or rather takes them for gifts and charms of mind and body and talks of them to his friends as wit and grace i however for though i pass for the father i am but the stepfather to don quixote have no desire to go with the current of custom or to implore thee dearest reader almost with tears in my eyes as others do to pardon or excuse the defects thou wilt perceive in this child of mine thou art neither its kinsman nor its friend thy soul is thine own and thy will as free as any man's whate'er he be thou art in thine own house and master of it as much as the king of his taxes and thou knowest the common saying under my cloak i kill the king all which exempts and frees thee from every consideration and obligation and thou canst say what thou wilt of the story without fear of being abused for any ill or rewarded for any good thou mayest say of it my wish would be simply to present it to thee plain and unadorned without any embellishment of preface or uncountable muster of customary sonnets epigrams and eulogies such as are commonly put at the beginning of books for i can tell thee though composing it cost me some labour i found none greater than the making of this preface thou art now reading many times did i take up my pen to write it and many did i lay it down again not knowing what to write one of these times as i was pondering with the paper before me a pen in my ear my elbow on the desk and my cheek in my hand thinking of what i should say there came in unexpectedly a certain lively clever friend of mine who seeing me so deep in thought asked the reason to which i making no mystery of it answered that i was thinking of the preface i had to make for the story of don quixote which so troubled me that i had a mind not to make any at all nor even publish the achievements of so noble a knight for how could you expect me not to feel uneasy about what that ancient lawgiver they call the public will say when it sees me after slumbering so many years in the silence of oblivion coming out now with all my years upon my back and with a book as dry as a rush devoid of invention meagre in style poor in thoughts wholly wanting in learning and wisdom without quotations in the margin or annotations at the end after the fashion of other books i see which though all fables and profanity are so full of maxims from aristotle and plato and the whole herd of philosophers that they fill the readers with amazement and convince them that the authors are men of learning erudition and eloquence 
and then when they quote the holy scriptures any one would say they are saint thomas's or other doctors of the church observing as they do a decorum so ingenious that in one sentence they describe a distracted lover and in the next deliver a devout little sermon that it is a pleasure and a treat to hear and read of all this there will be nothing in my book for i have nothing to quote in the margin or to note at the end and still less do i know what authors i follow in it to place them at the beginning as all do under the letters a b c beginning with aristotle and ending with xenophon or zoilus or zeuxis though one was a slanderer and the other a painter also my book must do without sonnets at the beginning at least sonnets whose authors are dukes marquises counts bishops ladies or famous poets though if i were to ask two or three obliging friends i know they would give me them and such as the productions of those that have the highest reputation in our spain could not equal in short my friend i continued i am determined the senor don quixote shall remain buried in the archives of his own la mancha until heaven provides some one to garnish him with all those things he stands in need of because i find myself through my shallowness and want of learning unequal to supplying them and because i am by nature shy and careless about hunting for authors to say what i myself can say without them hence the cogitation and abstraction you found me in and reason enough what you have heard from me hearing this my friend giving himself a slap on the forehead and breaking into a hearty laugh exclaimed before god brother now am i disabused of an error in which i have been living all this long time i have known you all through which i have taken you to be shrewd and sensible in all you do but now i see you are as far from that as the heaven is from the earth it is possible that things of so little moment and so easy to set right can occupy and perplex a ripe wit like yours fit to break through and crush far greater obstacles by my faith this comes not of any want of ability but of too much indolence and too little knowledge of life do you want to know if i am telling the truth well then attend to me and you will see how in the opening and shutting of an eye i sweep away all your difficulties and supply all those deficiencies which you say check and discourage you from bringing before the world the story of your famous don quixote the light and mirror of all knight errantry say on said i listening to his talk how do you propose to make up for my diffidence and reduce to order this chaos of perplexity i am in to which he made answer your first difficulty about the sonnets epigrams or complimentary verses which you want for the beginning and which ought to be by persons of importance and rank can be removed if you yourself take a little trouble to make them you can afterwards baptize them and put any name you like to them fathering them on prester john of the indies or the emperor of trebizond who to my knowledge were said to have been famous poets and even if they were not and any pedants or bachelors should attack you and question the fact never care two maravedis for that for even if they prove a lie against you they cannot cut off the hand you wrote it with as to references in the margin to the books and authors from whom you take the aphorisms and sayings you put into your story it is only contriving to fit in nicely any sentences or scraps of latin you may happen to have by heart or at any rate that will not give you much trouble to look up so as when you speak of freedom and captivity to insert non bene pro toto libertas venditur auro and then refer in the margin to horace or whoever said it or if you allude to the power of death to come in with pallida mors aequo pulsat pede pauperum tabernas regunque tures if it be friendship and the love god bids us bear to our enemy go at once to the holy scriptures which you can do with a very small amount of research and quote no less than the words of god himself ego autum dico vobis diligite inimicos vestros if you speak of evil thoughts turn to the gospel decorde exeunt cogitationes malae if of the fickleness of friends there is cato who will give you his distich donec eris felix multos numerabis amicos tempora si fuerint nubila solus eris with these and such like bits of latin they will take you for a grammarian at all events and that nowadays is no small honour and profit 
with regard to adding annotations at the end of the book you may safely do it in this way if you mention any giant in your book contrive that it shall be the giant goliath and with this alone which will cost you almost nothing you have a grand note for you can put the giant goliath or goliath was a philistine whom the shepherd david slew by a mighty stone cast in the terebinth valley as is related in the book of kings in the chapter where you find it written next to prove yourself a man of erudition in polite literature and cosmography manage that the river tagus shall be named in your story and there you are at once with another famous annotation setting forth the river tagus was so called after a king of spain it has its source in such and such a place and falls into the ocean kissing the walls of the famous city of lisbon and it is a common belief that it has golden sands etc etc if you should have anything to do with robbers i will give you the story of cacus for i have it by heart if with loose women there is the bishop of mondonedo who will give you the loan of lamia lida and flora any reference to whom will bring you great credit if with hard-hearted ones ovid will furnish you with medea if with witches or enchantresses homer has calypso and virgil kirky if with valiant captains julius caesar himself will lend you himself in his own commentaries and plutarch will give you a thousand alexanders if you should deal with love with two ounces you may know of tuscan you can go to leon the hebrew who will supply you to your heart's content or if you should not care to go to foreign countries you have at home fonseca's of the love of god in which is condensed all that you or the most imaginative mind can want on the subject in short all you have to do is to manage to quote these names or refer to these stories i have mentioned and leave it to me to insert the annotations and quotations and i swear by all that's good to fill your margins and use up four sheets at the end of the book now let us come to those references to authors which other books have and you want for yours the remedy for this is very simple you have only to look out for some book that quotes them all from a to z as you say yourself and then insert the very same alphabet in your book and though the imposition may be plain to see because you have so little need to borrow from them that is no matter there will probably be some simple enough to believe that you have made use of them all in this plain artless story of yours at any rate if it answers no other purpose this long catalogue of authors will serve to give a surprising look of authority to your book besides no one will trouble himself to verify whether you have followed them or whether you have not being no way concerned in it especially as if i mistake not this book of yours has no need of any one of those things you say at once for it is from beginning to end an attack upon the books of chivalry of which aristotle never dreamt nor saint basil said a word nor cicero had any knowledge nor do the niceties of truth nor the observations of astrology come within the range of its fanciful vagaries nor have geometrical measurements or refutations of the arguments used in rhetoric anything to do with it nor does it mean to preach to anybody mixing up things human and divine a sort of motley in which no christian understanding should dress itself it has only to avail itself of truth to nature in its composition and the more perfect the imitation the better the work will be and as this piece of yours aims at nothing more than to destroy the authority and influence which books of chivalry have in the world and with the public there is no need for you to go a begging for aphorisms from philosophers precepts from holy scripture fables from poets speeches from orators or miracles from saints but merely to take care that your style and diction run musically pleasantly and plainly with clear proper and well-placed words setting forth your purpose to the best of your power and putting your ideas intelligibly without confusion or obscurity strive too that in reading your story the melancholy may be moved to laughter and the merry made merrier still that the simple shall not be wearied that the judicious shall admire the invention that the grave shall not despise it nor the wise fail to praise it finally keep your aim fixed on the destruction of that ill-founded edifice of the books of chivalry hated by some and praised by many more for if you succeed in this you will have achieved no small success in profound silence i listened to what my friend said 
and his observations made such an impression on me that without attempting to question them i admitted their soundness and out of them i determined to make this preface wherein gentle reader thou wilt perceive my friend's good sense my good fortune in finding such an adviser in such a time of need and what thou hast gained in receiving without addition or alteration the story of the famous don quixote of la mancha who is held by all the inhabitants of the district of the campo de montiel to have been the chastest lover and the bravest knight that has for many years been seen in that neighbourhood i have no desire to magnify the service i render thee in making thee acquainted with so renowned and honoured a knight but i do desire thy thanks for the acquaintance thou wilt make with the famous sancho panza his squire in whom to my thinking i have given thee condensed all the squirely drolleries that are scattered through the swarm of the vain books of chivalry and so may god give thee health and not forget me vale dedication of volume one to the duke of behar marquis of gebralion count of benalcazar and benares viscount of the puebla del alcocer master of the towns of capilla curiel and burgios in belief of the good reception and honours that your excellency bestows on all sort of books as prince so inclined to favour good arts chiefly those who by their nobleness do not submit to the service and bribery of the vulgar i have determined bringing to light the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha in shelter of your excellency's glamorous name to whom with the obeisance i owe to such grandeur i pray to receive it agreeably under his protection so that in this shadow though deprived of that precious ornament of elegance and erudition that clothe the works composed in the houses of those who know it dares appear with assurance in the judgment of some who trespassing the bounds of their own ignorance used to condemn with more rigour and less justice the writings of others it is my earnest hope that your excellency's good counsel in regard to my honourable purpose will not disdain the littleness of so humble a service miguel de cervantes end of author's preface and dedication Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 1 Of the Ingenious Gentleman, Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 1, which treats of the character and pursuits of the famous gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. In a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived not long since one of those gentlemen that keep a lance in the lance rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing an olla of rather more beef than mutton a salad on most nights scraps on saturdays lentils on fridays and a pigeon or so extra on sundays made away with three quarters of his income the rest of it went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun he had in his house a housekeeper past forty a niece under twenty and a lad for the field and market-place who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the bill-hook the age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on fifty he was of a hardy habit spare gaunt featured a very early riser and a great sportsman they will have it his surname was quijada or quesada for here there is some difference of opinion among the authors who write on the subject although from reasonable conjectures it seems plain that he was called quijana this however is of but little importance to our tale it will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth in the telling of it you must know then that the above-named gentleman whenever he was at leisure which was mostly all the year round gave himself up to reading books of chivalry with such ardour and avidity that he almost entirely neglected the pursuit of his field sports and even the management of his property 
and to such a pitch did his eagerness and infatuation go that he sold many an acre of tillage land to buy books of chivalry to read and brought home as many of them as he could get but of all there were none he liked so well as those of the famous feliciano da silva's composition for their lucidity of style and complicated conceits were as pearls in his sight particularly when in his reading he came upon courtships and cartels where he often found passages like the reason of the unreason with which my reason is afflicted so weakens my reason that with reason i murmur at your beauty or again the high heavens that of your divinity divinely fortify you with the stars render you deserving of the desert your greatness deserves over conceits of this sort the poor gentleman lost his wits and used to lie awake striving to understand them and worm the meaning out of them what aristotle himself could not have made out or extracted had he come to life again for that special purpose he was not at all easy about the wounds which don belianis gave and took because it seemed to him that great as were the surgeons who had cured him he must have had his face and body covered all over with seams and scars he commended however the author's way of ending his book with the promise of that interminable adventure and many a time was he tempted to take up his pen and finish it properly as is there proposed which no doubt he would have done and made a successful piece of work of it too had not greater and more absorbing thoughts prevented him many an argument did he have with the curate of his village a learned man and a graduate of sigenza as to which had been the better knight palmerin of england or amadis of gaul master nicholas the village barber however used to say that neither of them came up to the knight of phoebus and that if there was any that could compare with him it was don galaor the brother of amadis of gaul because he had a spirit that was equal to every occasion and was no finikin knight nor lachrymose like his brother while in the matter of valour he was not a whit behind him in short he became so absorbed in his books that he spent his nights from sunset to sunrise and his days from dawn to dark poring over them and what with little sleep and much reading his brains got so dry that he lost his wits his fancy grew full of what he used to read about in his books enchantments quarrels battles challenges wounds wooings loves agonies and all sorts of impossible nonsense and it so possessed his mind that the whole fabric of invention and fancy he read of was true that to him no history in the world had more reality in it he used to say that the cid ruy diaz was a very good knight but that he was not to be compared with the knight of the burning sword who with one backstroke cut in half two fierce and monstrous giants he thought more of bernardo del carpio because at roncesvalles he slew roland in spite of enchantments availing himself of the artifice of hercules when he strangled antaeus the son of terra in his arms he approved highly of the giant morgante because although of the giant breed which is always arrogant and ill-conditioned he alone was affable and well-bred but above all he admired reynaldo of montauban especially when he saw him sallying forth from his castle and robbing every one he met and when beyond the seas he stole that image of mahomet which as his history says was entirely of gold and to have a bout of kicking at that traitor of a ganelon he would have given his housekeeper and his niece into the bargain in short his wits being quite gone he hit upon the strangest notion that ever madman in this world hit upon and that was that he fancied it was right and requisite as well for the support of his own honour as for the service of his country that he should make a knight-errant of himself roaming the world over in full armour and on horseback in quest of adventures and putting in practice himself all that he had read of as being the usual practices of knights-errant writing every kind of wrong and exposing himself to peril and danger from which in the issue he was to reap eternal renown and fame already the poor man saw himself crowned by the might of his arm emperor of trebizond at least and so led away by the intense enjoyment he found in these pleasant fancies he set himself forthwith to put his scheme into execution the first thing he did was to clean up some armour that had belonged to his great-grandfather and had been for ages lying forgotten in a corner eaten with rust and covered with mildew he scoured and polished it as best he could 
but he perceived one great defect in it that it had no closed helmet and nothing but a simple morion this deficiency however his ingenuity supplied for he contrived a kind of half helmet of pasteboard which fitted on to the morion looked like a whole one it is true that in order to see if it was strong and fit to stand a cut he drew his sword and gave it a couple of slashes the first of which undid in an instant what had taken him a week to do the ease with which he had knocked it to pieces disconcerted him somewhat and to guard against that danger he set to work again fixing bars of iron on the inside until he was satisfied with its strength and then not caring to try any more experiments with it he passed it and adopted it as a helmet of the most perfect construction he next proceeded to inspect his hack which with more quartos than a real and more blemishes than the steed of gonella that tantum pelis et asse fuit surpassed in his eyes the bucephalus of alexander or the babieca of the cid four days were spent in thinking what name to give him because as he said to himself it was not right that a horse belonging to a knight so famous and one with such merits of his own should be without some distinctive name and he strove to adapt it so as to indicate what he had been before belonging to a knight-errant and what he then was for it was only reasonable that his master taking a new character he should take a new name and that it should be a distinguished and full-sounding one befitting the new order and calling he was about to follow and so after having composed struck out rejected added to unmade and remade a multitude of names out of his memory and fancy he decided upon calling him rocinante a name to his thinking lofty sonorous and significant of his condition as a hack before he became what he now was the first and foremost of all the hacks in the world having got a name for his horse so much to his taste he was anxious to get one for himself and he was eight days more pondering over this point till at last he made up his mind to call himself don quixote whence as has been already said the authors of this voracious history have inferred that his name must have been beyond a doubt quijada and not quesada as others would have it recollecting however that the valiant amadis was not content to call himself curtly amadis and nothing more but added the name of his kingdom and country to make it famous and called himself amadis of gaul he like a good knight resolved to add on the name of his and to style himself don quixote of la mancha whereby he considered he described accurately his origin and country and did honour to it in taking his surname from it so then his armour being furbished his morion turned into a helmet his hack christened and he himself confirmed he came to the conclusion that nothing more was needed now but to look out for a lady to be in love with for a knight errant without love was like a tree without leaves or fruit or a body without a soul as he said to himself if for my sins or by my good fortune i come across some giant hereabouts a common occurrence with knights errant and overthrow him in one onslaught or cleave him asunder to the waist or in short vanquish and subdue him will it not be well to have someone i may send him to as a present that he may come in and fall on his knees before my sweet lady and in a humble submissive voice say i am the giant caraculiambro lord of the island of malindrania vanquished in single combat by the never sufficiently extolled knight don quixote of la mancha who has commanded me to present myself before your grace that your highness dispose of me at your pleasure oh how our good gentleman enjoyed the delivery of this speech especially when he had thought of some one to call his lady there was so the story goes in a village near his own a very good-looking farm girl with whom he had been at one time in love though so far as is known she never knew it nor gave a thought to the matter her name was aldonza lorenzo and upon her he thought fit to confer the title of lady of his thoughts and after some search for a name which should not be out of harmony with her own and should suggest and indicate that of a princess and great lady he decided upon calling her dulcinea del toboso she being of el toboso a name to his mind musical uncommon and significant like all those he had already bestowed upon himself and the things belonging to him End of Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 1 
Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part One, Chapter Two of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume One, Part One, Chapter Two which treats of the first sally the ingenious don quixote made from home these preliminaries settled he did not care to put off any longer the execution of his design urged on to it by the thought of all the world was losing by his delay seeing what wrongs he intended to right grievances to redress injustices to repair abuses to remove and duties to discharge so without giving notice of his intention to any one and without anybody seeing him one morning before the dawning of the day which was one of the hottest of the month of july he donned his suit of armor mounted rocinante with his patched up helmet on braced his buckler took his lance and by the back door of the yard sallied forth upon the plain in the highest contentment and satisfaction at seeing with what ease he had made a beginning with his grand purpose but scarcely did he find himself upon the open plain when a terrible thought struck him one all but enough to make him abandon the enterprise at the very outset it occurred to him that he had not been dubbed a knight and that according to the law of chivalry he neither could nor ought to bear arms against any knight and that even if he had been still he ought as a novice knight to wear white armor without a device upon the shield until by his prowess he had earned one these reflections made him waver in his purpose but his craze being stronger than any reasoning he made up his mind to have himself dubbed a knight by the first one he came across following the example of others in the same case as he had read in the books that brought him to this pass as for white armor he resolved on the first opportunity to scour his until it was whiter than an ermine and so comforting himself he pursued his way taking that which his horse chose for in this he believed lay the essence of adventures thus setting out our new-fledged adventurer paced along talking to himself and saying who knows but that in time to come when the voracious history of my famous deeds is made known the sage who writes it when he has to set forth my first sally in the early morning will do it after this fashion Quote, scarce had the rubicund apollo spread o'er the face of the broad spacious earth the golden threads of his bright hair scarce had the little birds of painted plumage attuned their notes to hail with dulcet and mellifluous harmony the coming of the rosy dawn that deserting the soft couch of her jealous spouse was appearing to mortals at the gates and balconies of the manchigan horizon when the renowned knight don quixote of la mancha quitting the lazy down mounted his celebrated steed rocinante and began to traverse the ancient and famous campo de montiel which in fact he was actually traversing happy the age happy the time he continued in which shall be made known my deeds of fame worthy to be moulded in brass carved in marble limbed in pictures for a memorial forever and thou o sage magician whoever thou art to whom it shall fall to be the chronicler of this wondrous history forget not i entreat thee my good rocinante the constant companion of my ways and wanderings presently he broke out again as if he were love-stricken in earnest o oh, princess dulcinea lady of this captive heart a grievous wrong hast thou done me to drive me forth with scorn and with inexorable obduracy banish me from the presence of thy beauty o lady deign to hold in remembrance this heart thy vassal that thus in anguish pines for love of thee so he went on stringing together these and other absurdities all in the style of those his books had taught him imitating their language as well as he could and all the while he rode so slowly and the sun mounted so rapidly and with such fervour that it was enough to melt his brains if he had any nearly all day he travelled without anything remarkable happening to him at which he was in despair for he was anxious to encounter some one at once upon whom to try the might of his strong arm writers there are who say the first adventure he met with was that of puerto lapis others say it was that of the windmills but what i have ascertained on this point 
and what i have found written in the annals of la mancha is that he was on the road all day and towards nightfall his hack and he found themselves dead tired and hungry when looking all around to see if he could discover any castle or shepherd's shanty where he might refresh himself and relieve his sore wants he perceived not far out of his road an inn which was welcome as a star guiding him to the portals if not the palaces of his redemption and quickening his pace he reached it just as night was setting in at the door were standing two young women girls of the district as they call them on their way to seville with some carriers who had chanced to halt that night at the inn and as happened what might to our adventurer everything he saw or imagined seemed to him to be and to happen after the fashion of what he had read of the moment he saw the inn he pictured it to himself as a castle with its four turrets and pinnacles of shining silver not forgetting the drawbridge and moat and all the belongings usually ascribed to castles of the sort to this inn which to him seemed a castle he advanced and at a short distance from it he checked rocinante hoping that some dwarf would show himself upon the battlements and by sound of trumpet give notice that a knight was approaching the castle but seeing that they were slow about it and that rocinante was in a hurry to reach the stable he made for the inn door and perceived the two gay damsels who were standing there and who seemed to him to be two fair maidens or lovely ladies taking their ease at the castle gate at this moment it so happened that a swineherd who was going through the stubbles collecting a drove of pigs for without any apology that is what they are called gave a blast of his horn to bring them together and forthwith it seemed to don quixote to be what he was expecting the signal of some dwarf announcing his arrival and so with prodigious satisfaction he rode up to the inn and to the ladies who seeing a man of this sort approaching in full armour and with lance and buckler were turning in dismay into the inn when don quixote guessing their fear by their flight raising his pasteboard visor disclosed his dry dusty visage and with courteous bearing and gentle voice addressed them your ladyships need not fly or fear any rudeness for that it belongs not to the order of knighthood which i profess to offer to any one much less to high-born maidens as your appearance proclaims you to be the girls were looking at him and straining their eyes to make out the features which the clumsy visor obscured but when they heard themselves called maidens a thing so much out of their line they could not restrain their laughter which made don quixote wax indignant and say modesty becomes the fair and moreover laughter that has little cause is great silliness this however i say not to pain or anger you for my desire is none other than to serve you the incomprehensible language and the unpromising looks of our cavalier only increased the lady's laughter and that increased his irritation and matters might have gone farther if at that moment the landlord had not come out who being a very fat man was a very peaceful one he seeing this grotesque figure clad in armour that did not match any more than his saddle bridle lance buckler or corslet was not at all indisposed to join the damsels in their manifestations of amusement but in truth standing in awe of such a complicated armament he thought it best to speak him fairly so he said senor caballero if your wishop wants lodging baiting the bed for there is not one in the inn there is plenty of everything else here don quixote observing the respectful bearing of the alcaide of the fortress for so innkeeper and inn seemed in his eyes made answer sir castellan for me anything will suffice for my armour is my only wear my only rest the fray the host fancied he called him castellan because he took him for a worthy of castile though he was in fact an andalusian and one from the strand of san lucar as crafty a thief as cassus and as full of tricks as a student or a page in that case said he your bed is on the flinty rock your sleep to watch all way and if so you may dismount and safely reckon upon any quantity of sleeplessness under this roof for a twelve month not to say for a single night so saying he advanced to hold the stirrup for don quixote who got down with great difficulty and exertion for he had not broken his fast all day and then charged the host to take great care of his horse as he was the best bit of flesh that ever ate bread in this world the landlord eyed him over 
but did not find him as good as don quixote said nor even half as good and putting him up in the stable he returned to see what might be wanted by his guest whom the damsels who had by this time made their peace with him were now relieving of his armour they had taken off his breastplate and back piece but they neither knew nor saw how to open his gorget or remove his makeshift helmet for he had fastened it with green ribbons which as there was no untying the knots required to be cut this however he would not by any means consent to so he remained all the evening with his helmet on the drollest and oddest figure that can be imagined and while they were removing his armor taking the baggages who were about it for ladies of high degree belonging to the castle he said to them with great sprightliness oh never surely was there knight so served by hand of dame as served was he don quixote hight when from his town he came with maidens waiting on himself princesses on his hack or rocinante or that lady's mine is my horse's name and don quixote of la mancha is my own for though i had no intention of declaring myself until my achievements in your service and honour had made me known the necessity of adapting that old ballad of lancelot to the present occasion has given you the knowledge of my name altogether prematurely a time however will come for your ladyships to command and me to obey and then the might of my arm will show my desire to serve you the girls who were not used to hearing rhetoric of this sort had nothing to say in reply they only asked him if he wanted anything to eat i would gladly eat a bit of something said don quixote for i feel it would come very seasonably the day happened to be a friday and in the whole inn there was nothing but some pieces of the fish they call in castile abedejo in andalusia bacalao and in some places curadillo and in others troutlet so they asked him if he thought he could eat troutlet for there was no other fish to give him if there be troutlets enough said don quixote they will be the same thing as a trout for it is all one to me whether i am given eight reals in small change or a piece of eight however it may be that these troutlets are like veal which is better than beef or kid which is better than goat well whatever it be let it come quickly for the burden and pressure of arms cannot be borne without support to the inside they laid a table for him at the door of the inn for the sake of the air and the host brought him a portion of ill-soaked and worse-cooked stockfish and a piece of bread as black and mouldy as his own armour but a laughable sight it was to see him eating for having his helmet on and the beaver up he could not with his own hands put anything into his mouth unless someone else placed it there and this service one of the ladies rendered him but to give him anything to drink was impossible or would have been so had not the landlord bored a reed and putting one end in his mouth poured the wine into him through the other all of which he bore with patience rather than sever the ribbons of his helmet while this was going on there came up to the inn a pig gelder who as he approached sounded his reed pipe four or five times and thereby completely convinced don quixote that he was in some famous castle and that they were regaling him with music and that the stockfish was trout the bread the whitest the wenches ladies and the landlord the castellan of the castle and consequently he held that his enterprise and sally had been to some purpose but still it distressed him to think that he had not been dubbed a knight for it was plain to him he could not lawfully engage in any adventure without receiving the order of knighthood. End of Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 2 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 3 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 3. Wherein is related the droll way in which Don Quixote had himself dubbed a knight. Harassed by this reflection, he made haste with his scanty pothouse supper, and having finished it, called the landlord and shutting himself into the stable with him fell on his knees before him saying from this spot i rise not valiant knight until your courtesy grants me the boon i seek one that will redound to your praise and the benefit of the human race 
the landlord seeing his guest at his feet and hearing a speech of this kind stood staring at him in bewilderment not knowing what to do or say and entreating him to rise but all to no purpose until he had agreed to grant the boon demanded of him i look for no less my lord from your high magnificence replied don quixote and i have to tell you that the boon i have asked and your liberality has granted is that you shall dub me knight to-morrow morning and that to-night i shall watch my arms in the chapel of this your castle thus to-morrow as i have said will be accomplished what i so much desire enabling me lawfully to roam through all the four quarters of the world seeking adventures on behalf of those in distress as is the duty of chivalry and of knights errant like myself whose ambition is directed to such deeds the landlord who as has been mentioned was something of a wag and had already some suspicion of his guest's want of wits was quite convinced of it on hearing talk of this kind from him and to make sport for the night he determined to fall in with his humour so he told him he was quite right in pursuing the object he had in view and that such a motive was natural and becoming in cavaliers as distinguished as he seemed and his gallant bearing showed him to be and that he himself in his younger days had followed the same honourable calling roaming in quest of adventures in various parts of the world among others the curing grounds of malaga the isles of riaran the precinct of seville the little market of segovia the olivera of valencia the rondilla of granada the strand of san lucar the cult of cordova the taverns of toledo and divers other quarters where he had proved the nimbleness of his feet and the lightness of his fingers doing many wrongs cheating many widows ruining maids and swindling minors and in short bringing himself under the notice of almost every tribunal and court of justice in spain until at last he had retired to this castle of his where he was living upon his property and upon that of others and where he received all knights errant of whatever rank or condition they might be all for the great love he bore them and that they might share their substance with him in return for his benevolence he told him moreover that in this castle of his there was no chapel in which he could watch his armour as it had been pulled down in order to be rebuilt but that in a case of necessity it might he knew be watched anywhere and he might watch it that night in a courtyard of the castle and in the morning god willing the requisite ceremonies might be performed so as to have him dubbed a knight and so thoroughly dubbed that nobody could be more so he asked if he had any money with him to which don quixote replied that he had not a farthing as in the histories of knights errant he had never read of any of them carrying any on this point the landlord told him he was mistaken for though not recorded in the histories because in the author's opinion there was no need to mention anything so obvious and necessary as money and clean shirts it was not to be supposed therefore that they did not carry them and he might regard it as certain and established that all knights errant about whom there were so many full and unimpeachable books carried well furnished purses in case of emergency and likewise carried shirts and a little box of ointment to cure the wounds they received for in those plains and deserts where they engaged in combat and came out wounded it was not always that there was someone to cure them unless indeed they had for a friend some sage magician to succour them at once by fetching through the air upon a cloud some damsel or dwarf with a vial of water of such virtue that by tasting one drop of it they were cured of their hurts and wounds in an instant and left as sound as if they had not received any damage whatever but in case this should not occur the knights of old took care to see that their squires were provided with money and other requisites such as lint and ointments for healing purposes and when it happened that knights had no squires which was rarely and seldom the case they themselves carried everything in cunning saddle-bags that were hardly seen on the horse's croup as if it were something else of more importance because unless for some such reason carrying saddle-bags was not very favourably regarded among knights errant he therefore advised him and as his godson so soon to be he might even command him never from that time forth to travel without money and the usual requirements and he would find the advantage of them when he least expected it don quixote promised to follow his advice scrupulously 
and it was arranged forthwith that he should watch his armor in a large yard at one side of the inn so collecting it all together don quixote placed it on a trough that stood by the side of a well and bracing his buckler on his arm he grasped his lance and began with a stately air to march up and down in front of the trough and as he began his march night began to fall the landlord told all the people who were in the inn about the craze of his guest the watching of the armor and the dubbing ceremony he contemplated full of wonder at so strange a form of madness they flocked to see it from a distance and observed with what composure he sometimes paced up and down or sometimes leaning on his lance gazed on his armor without taking his eyes off it for ever so long and as the night closed in with a light from the moon so brilliant that it might vie with his that lent it everything the novice knight did was plainly seen by all meanwhile one of the carriers who were in the inn thought fit to water his team and it was necessary to remove don quixote's armor as it lay on the trough but he seeing the other approach hailed him in a loud voice o thou whoever thou art rash knight that comest to lay hands on the armor of the most valorous errant that ever girt on sword have a care what thou dost touch it not unless thou wouldst lay down thy life as the penalty of thy rashness the carrier gave no heed to these words and he would have done better to heed them if he had been heedful of his health but seizing it by the straps flung the armor some distance from him seeing this don quixote raised his eyes to heaven and fixing his thoughts apparently upon his lady dulcinea exclaimed aid me lady mine in this the first encounter that presents itself to this breast which thou holdest in subjection let not thy favor and protection fail me in this first jeopardy and with these words and others to the same purpose dropping his buckler he lifted his lance with both hands and with it smote such a blow on the carrier's head that he stretched him on the ground so stunned that had he followed it up with a second there would have been no need of a surgeon to cure him this done he picked up his armor and returned to his beat with the same serenity as before shortly after this another not knowing what had happened for the carrier still lay senseless came with the same object of giving water to his mules and was proceeding to remove the armor in order to clear the trough when don quixote without uttering a word or imploring aid from any one once more dropped his buckler and once more lifted his lance and without actually breaking the second carrier's head into pieces made more than three of it for he laid it open in four at the noise all the people of the inn ran to the spot and among them the landlord seeing this don quixote braced his buckler on his arm and with his hand on his sword exclaimed o lady of beauty strength and support of my faint heart it is time for thee to turn the eyes of thy greatness on this thy captive knight on the brink of so mighty an adventure by this he felt himself so inspirited that he would not have flinched if all the carriers in the world had assailed him the comrades of the wounded perceiving the plight they were in began from a distance to shower stones on don quixote who screened himself as best he could with his buckler not daring to quit the trough and leave his armor unprotected the landlord shouted to them to leave him alone for he had already told them that he was mad and as a madman he would not be accountable even if he killed them all still louder shouted don quixote calling them knaves and traitors and the lord of the castle who allowed knights errant to be treated in this fashion a villain and a low-born knight whom had he received the order of knighthood he would call to account for his treachery but of you he cried base and vile rabble i make no account fling strike come on do all you can against me ye shall see what the reward of your folly and insolence will be this he uttered with so much spirit and boldness that he filled his assailants with a terrible fear and as much for this reason as at the persuasion of the landlord they left off stoning him and he allowed them to carry off the wounded and with the same calmness and composure as before resumed the watch over his armor but these freaks of his guest were not much to the liking of the landlord so he determined to cut matters short and confer upon him at once the unlucky order of knighthood before any further misadventure could occur so going up to him he apologized for the rudeness which without his knowledge had been offered to him by these low people who however had been well punished for their audacity 
as he had already told him he said there was no chapel in the castle nor was it needed for what remained to be done for as he understood the ceremonial of the order the whole point of being dubbed a knight lay in the accolade and in the slap on the shoulder and that could be administered in the middle of a field and that he had now done all that was needful as to watching the armor for all requirements were satisfied by a watch of two hours only while he had been more than four about it don quixote believed it all and told him he stood there ready to obey him and to make an end of it with as much dispatch as possible for if he were again attacked and felt himself to be a dubbed knight he would not he thought leave a soul alive in the castle except such as out of respect he might spare at his bidding thus warned and menaced the castellan forthwith brought out a book in which he used to enter the straw and barley he served out to the carriers and with a lad carrying a candle end and the two damsels already mentioned he returned to where don quixote stood and bade him kneel down then reading from his account book as if he were repeating some devout prayer in the middle of his delivery he raised his hand and gave him a sturdy blow on the neck and then with his own sword a smart slap on the shoulder all the while muttering between his teeth as if he were saying his prayers having done this he directed one of the ladies to gird on his sword which she did with great self-possession and gravity and not a little was required to prevent a burst of laughter at each stage of the ceremony but what they had already seen of the novice knight's prowess kept their laughter within bounds on girding him with a sword the worthy lady said to him may god make your worship a very fortunate knight and grant you success in battle don quixote asked her name in order that he might from that time forward know to whom he was beholden for the favor he had received as he meant to confer upon her some portion of the honor he acquired by the might of his arm she answered with great humility that she was called la tolosa and that she was a daughter of a cobbler of toledo who lived in the stalls of sancho bianaya and that wherever she might be she would serve and esteem him as her lord don quixote said in reply that she would do him a favor if thenceforward she assumed the don and called herself dona tolosa she promised she would and then the other buckled on his spur and with her followed almost the same conversation as with the lady of the sword he asked her name and she said it was la molinera and that she was the daughter of a respectable miller of antiquera and of her likewise don quixote requested that she would adopt the don and call herself dona molinera making offers to her of further services and favors having thus with hot haste and speed brought to a conclusion these never till now seen ceremonies don quixote was on thorns until he saw himself on horseback sallying forth in quest of adventures and saddling rocinante at once he mounted and embracing his host as he returned thanks for his kindness in knighting him he addressed him in language so extraordinary that it is impossible to convey an idea of it or report it the landlord to get him out of the inn replied with no less rhetoric though with shorter words and without calling upon him to pay the reckoning let him go with a godspeed end of volume one part one chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter four of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter four of what happened to our knight when he left the inn day was dawning when don quixote quitted the inn so happy so gay so exhilarated at finding himself dubbed a knight that his joy was like to burst his horse girths however recalling the advice of his host as to the requisites he ought to carry with him especially that referring to money and shirts he determined to go home and provide himself with all and also with a squire for he reckoned upon securing a farm laborer a neighbor of his a poor man with a family but very well qualified for the office of squire to a knight with this object he turned his horse's head towards his village and rocinante thus reminded of his old quarters stepped out so briskly that he hardly seemed to tread the earth he had not gone far when out of a thicket on his right 
there seemed to come feeble cries as of someone in distress and the instant he heard them he exclaimed thanks be to heaven for the favor it accords me that it so soon offers me an opportunity of fulfilling the obligation i have undertaken and gathering the fruit of my ambition these cries no doubt come from some man or woman in want of help and needing my aid and protection and wheeling he turned rocinante in the direction whence the cries seemed to proceed he had gone but a few paces into the wood when he saw a mare tied to an oak and tied to another and stripped from the waist upwards a youth of about fifteen years of age from whom the cries came nor were they without cause for a lusty farmer was flogging him with a belt and following up every blow with scoldings and commands repeating your mouth shut and your eyes open while the youth made answer i won't do it again master mine by god's passion i won't do it again and i'll take more care of the flock another time seeing what was going on don quixote said in an angry voice discourteous knight it ill becomes you to assail one who cannot defend himself mount your steed and take your lance for there was a lance leaning against the oak to which the mare was tied and i will make you know that you are behaving as a coward the farmer seeing before him this figure in full armor brandishing a lance over his head gave himself up for dead and made answer meekly sir knight this youth that i am chastising is my servant employed by me to watch a flock of sheep that i have hard by and he is so careless that i lose one every day and when i punish him for his carelessness and knavery he says i do it out of niggardliness to escape paying him the wages i owe him and before god and on my soul he lies lies before me base clown said don quixote by the sun that shines on us i have a mind to run you through with this lance pay him at once without another word and if not by the god that rules us i will make an end of you and annihilate you on the spot release him instantly the farmer hung his head and without a word untied his servant of whom don quixote asked how much his master owed him he replied nine months at seven reals a month don quixote added it up found that it came to sixty-three reals and told the farmer to pay it down immediately if he did not want to die for it the trembling clown replied that as he lived and by the oath he had sworn though he had not sworn any it was not so much for there were to be taken into account and deducted three pairs of shoes he had given him and a real for two bloodlettings when he was sick all that is very well said don quixote but let the shoes and the bloodletting stand as a set-off against the blows you have given him without any cause for if he spoiled the leather of the shoes you paid for you have damaged that of his body and if the barber took blood from him when he was sick you have drawn it when he was sound so on that score he owes you nothing the difficulty is sir knight that i have no money here let andres come home with me and i will pay him all real by real i go with him said the youth nay god forbid no senor not for the world for once alone with me he would flay me like a saint bartholomew he will do nothing of the kind said don quixote i have only to command and he will obey me and as he has sworn to me by the order of knighthood which he has received i leave him free and i guarantee the payment consider what you are saying senor said the youth this master of mine is not a knight nor has he received any order of knighthood for he is juan haldudo the rich of quintanar that matters little replied don quixote there may be aldudo's knights moreover every one is the son of his works that is true said andres but this master of mine of what works is he the son when he refuses me the wages of my sweat and labor i do not refuse brother andres said the farmer be good enough to come along with me and i swear by all the orders of knighthood there are in the world to pay you as i have agreed real by real and perfumed for the perfumery i excuse you said don quixote give it to him in reals and i shall be satisfied and see that you do as you have sworn if not by the same oath i swear to come back and hunt you out and punish you and i shall find you though you should lie closer than a lizard and if you desire to know who it is lays this command upon you that you may be more firmly bound to obey it know that i am the valorous don quixote of la mancha the undoer of wrongs and injustices and so god be with you and keep in mind what you have promised and sworn under those penalties that have been already declared to you 
so saying he gave rocinante the spur and was soon out of reach the farmer followed him with his eyes and when he saw that he had cleared the wood and was no longer in sight he turned to his boy andres and said come here my son i want to pay you what i owe you as that undoer of wrongs has commanded me my oath on it said andres your worship will be well advised to obey the command of that good knight may he live a thousand years for as he is a valiant and just judge by roque if you do not pay me he will come back and do as he said my oath on it too said the farmer but as i have a strong affection for you i want to add to the debt in order to add to the payment and seizing him by the arm he tied him up to the oak again where he gave him such a flogging that he left him for dead now master andres said the farmer call on the undoer of wrongs you will find he won't undo that though i am not sure that i have quite done with you for i have a good mind to flay you alive as you feared but at last he untied him and gave him leave to go look for his judge in order to put the sentence pronounced into execution andres went off rather down in the mouth swearing he would go to look for the valiant don quixote of la mancha and tell him exactly what had happened and that all would have to be repaid him sevenfold but for all that he went off weeping while his master stood laughing thus did the valiant don quixote right that wrong and thoroughly satisfied with what had taken place as he considered he had made a very happy and noble beginning with his knighthood he took the road towards his village in perfect self-content saying in a low voice well mayest thou this day call thyself fortunate above all on earth o dulcinea del toboso fairest of the fair since it has fallen to thy lot to hold subject and submissive to thy full will and pleasure a knight so renowned as is and will be don quixote of la mancha who as all the world knows yesterday received the order of knighthood and hath to-day righted the greatest wrong and grievance that ever injustice conceived and cruelty perpetrated who hath to-day plucked the rod from the hand of yonder ruthless oppressor so wantonly lashing that tender child he now came to a road branching in four directions and immediately he was reminded of those cross-roads where knights-errant used to stop to consider which road they should take in imitation of them he halted for a while and after having deeply considered it he gave rocinante his head submitting his own will to that of his hack who followed out of his first intention which was to make straight for his own stable after he had gone about two miles don quixote perceived a large party of people who as afterwards appeared were some toledo traders on their way to buy silk at murcia there were six of them coming along under their sunshades with four servants mounted and three muleteers on foot scarcely had don quixote described them when the fancy possessed him that this must be some new adventure and to help him to imitate as far as he could those passages he had read of in his books here seemed to come one made on purpose which he resolved to attempt so with a lofty bearing and determination he fixed himself firmly in his stirrups got his lance ready brought his buckler before his breast and planting himself in the middle of the road stood waiting the approach of these knights-errant for such he now considered and held them to be and when they had come near enough to see and hear he exclaimed with a haughty gesture all the world stand unless all the world confess that in all the world there is no maiden fairer than the empress of la mancha the peerless dulcinea del toboso the traders halted at the sound of this language and the sight of the strange figure that uttered it and from both figure and language at once guessed the craze of their owner they wished however to learn quietly what was the object of this confession that was demanded of them and one of them who was rather fond of a joke and was very sharp-witted said to him sir knight we do not know who this good lady is that you speak of show her to us for if she be of such beauty as you suggest with all our hearts and without any pressure we will confess the truth that is on your part required of us if i were to show her to you replied don quixote what merit would you have in confessing a truth so manifest the essential point is that without seeing her you must believe confess affirm swear and defend it else ye have to do with me in battle ill-conditioned arrogant rabble that ye are and come ye on one by one as the order of knighthood requires or all together as is the custom and vile usage of your breed here do i bide and await you 
relying on the justice of the cause i maintain sir knight replied the traitor i entreat your worship in the name of this present company of princes that to save us from charging our consciences with the confession of a thing we have never seen or heard of and one moreover so much to the prejudice of the empresses and queens of the alcaria in estremadura your worship will be pleased to show us some portrait of this lady though it be no bigger than a grain of wheat for by the thread one gets at the ball and in this way we shall be satisfied and easy and you will be content and pleased nay i believe we are already so far agreed with you that even though her portrait should show her blind of one eye and distilling vermilion and sulphur from the other we would nevertheless to gratify your worship say all in her favour that you desire she distills nothing of the kind vile rabble said don quixote burning with rage nothing of the kind i say only ambergris and civet and cotton nor is she one-eyed or hump-backed but straighter than a guadarrama spindle but ye must pay for the blasphemy ye have uttered against beauty like that of my lady and so saying he charged with levelled lance against the one who had spoken with such fury and fierceness that if luck had not contrived that rocinante should stumble midway and come down it would have gone hard with the rash traitor down went rocinante and over went his master rolling along the ground for some distance and when he tried to rise he was unable so encumbered was he with lance buckler spurs helmet and the weight of his old armor and all the while he was struggling to get up he kept saying fly not cowards and caitiffs stay for not by my fault but my horses am i stretched here one of the muleteers in attendance who could not have had much good nature in him hearing the poor prostrate man blustering in this style was unable to refrain from giving him an answer on his ribs and coming up to him he seized his lance and having broken it in pieces with one of them he began so to belabor our don quixote that notwithstanding and in spite of his armor he milled him like a measure of wheat his master called out not to lay on so hard and to leave him alone but the muleteer's blood was up and he did not care to drop the game until he had vented the rest of his wrath and gathering up the remaining fragments of the lance he finished with a discharge upon the unhappy victim who all through the storm of sticks that rained on him never ceased threatening heaven and earth and the brigands for such they seemed to him at last the muleteer was tired and the traders continued their journey taking with them matter for talk about the poor fellow who had just been cudgelled he when he found himself alone made another effort to rise but if he was unable when whole and sound how was he to rise after having been thrashed and well-nigh knocked to pieces and yet he esteemed himself fortunate as it seemed to him that this was a regular knight-errant's mishap and entirely he considered the fault of his horse however battered in body as he was to rise was beyond his power end of volume one part one chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter five of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter five in which the narrative of our knight's mishap is continued finding then that in fact he could not move he bethought himself of having recourse to his usual remedy which was to think of some passage in his books and his craze brought to his mind that about baldwin and the marquis of mantua when carlotta left him wounded on the mountain side a story known by heart by the children not forgotten by the young men and lauded and even believed by the old folk and for all that not a whit truer than the miracles of mahomet this seemed to him to fit exactly the case in which he found himself so making a show of severe suffering he began to roll on the ground and with feeble breath repeat the very words which the wounded knight of the wood is said to have uttered where art thou lady mine that thou my sorrow dost not rue thou canst not know it lady mine or else thou art untrue and so he went on with the ballad as far as the lines o noble marquis of mantua my uncle and liege lord as chance would have it 
when he had got to this line there happened to come by a peasant from his own village a neighbor of his who had been with a load of wheat to the mill and he seeing the man stretched there came up to him and asked him who he was and what was the matter with him that he complained so dolefully don quixote was firmly persuaded that this was the marquis of mantua his uncle so the only answer he made was to go on with his ballad in which he told the tale of his misfortune and of the loves of the emperor's son and his wife all exactly as the ballad sings it the peasant stood amazed at hearing such nonsense and relieving him of the visor already battered to pieces by blows he wiped his face which was covered with dust and as soon as he had done so he recognized him and said senor don quijada for so he appears to have been called when he was in his senses and had not yet changed from a quiet country gentleman into a knight-errant who has brought your worship to this pass but to all questions the other only went on with his ballad seeing this the good man removed as well as he could his breastplate and back-piece to see if he had any wound but he could perceive no blood nor any mark whatever he then contrived to raise him from the ground and with no little difficulty hoisted him upon his ass which seemed to him to be the easiest mount for him and collecting the arms even to the splinters of the lance he tied them on rocinante and leading him by the bridle and the ass by the halter he took the road for the village very sad to hear what absurd stuff don quixote was talking nor was don quixote less so for what with blows and bruises he could not sit upright on the ass and from time to time he sent up sighs to heaven so that once more he drove the peasant to ask what ailed him and it could have been only the devil himself that put into his head tales to match his own adventures for now forgetting baldwin he bethought himself of the moor abindarraez when the alcaide of antiquera rodrigo de Narvarez, took him prisoner and carried him away to his castle so that when the peasant again asked him how he was and what ailed him he gave him for reply the same words and phrases that the captive abenseraga gave to rodrigo de Navarrez, just as he had read the story in the diana of jorge de montemayor where it is written applying it to his own case so aptly that the peasant went along cursing his fate that he had to listen to such a lot of nonsense from which however he came to the conclusion that his neighbor was mad and so made all haste to reach the village to escape the wearisomeness of this harangue of don quixote's who at the end of it said senor don rodrigo de Navarrez, your worship must know that this fair harifa i have mentioned is now the lovely dulcinea del toboso for whom i have done am doing and will do the most famous deeds of chivalry that in this world have been seen are to be seen or ever shall be seen to this the peasant answered senor sinner that i am cannot your worship see that i am not don rodrigo de narvarez nor the marquis of mantua but pedro alonso your neighbor and that your worship is neither baldwin nor abindarez but the worthy gentleman senor cajada i know who i am replied don quixote and i know that i may be not only those i have named but all the twelve peers of france and even all the nine worthies since my achievements surpass all that they have done all together and each of them on his own account with this talk and more of the same kind they reached the village just as night was beginning to fall but the peasant waited until it was a little later that the belaboured gentleman might not be seen riding in such a miserable trim when it was what seemed to him the proper time he entered the village and went to don quixote's house which he found all in confusion and there were the curate and the village barber who were great friends of don quixote and his housekeeper was saying to them in a loud voice senor licentiate pero perez for so the curate was called what does your worship think can have befallen my master it is six days now since anything has been seen of him or the hack or the buckler lance or armor miserable me i am certain of it and it is as true as that i was born to die that these accursed books of chivalry he has and has got into the way of reading so constantly have upset his reason for now i remember having often heard him saying to himself that he would turn knight-errant and go all over the world in quest of adventures to the devil and barabbas with such books that have brought to ruin in this way the finest understanding there was in all la mancha the niece said the same and indeed more you must know master nicholas for that was the name of the barber 
it was often my uncle's way to stay two days and nights together poring over these unholy books of misventures after which he would fling the book away and snatch up his sword and fall to slashing the walls and when he was tired out he would say that he had killed four giants like four towers and the sweat that flowed from him when he was weary he said was the blood of the wounds he had received in battle and then he would drink a great jug of cold water and become calm and quiet saying that this water was the most precious potion which the sage esquife a great magician and friend of his had brought him but i take all the blame upon myself for never having told your worships of my uncle's vagaries that you might put a stop to them before things had come to this pass and burn all these accursed books for he has a great number that richly deserve to be burned like heretics so I say i too said the curate and by my faith to-morrow shall not pass without public judgment upon them and may they be condemned to the flames lest they lead these that read them to behave as my good friend seems to have behaved all this the peasant heard and from it he understood at last what was the matter with his neighbour so he began calling aloud open your worships to senor baldwin and to senor the marquis of mantua who comes badly wounded and to senor abindara as the moor when the valiant rodrigo de narvarez the alcaide of antequera brings captive at these words they all hurried out and when they recognized their friend master and uncle who had not yet dismounted from the ass because he could not they ran to embrace him hold said he or i am badly wounded through my horse's fault carry me to bed and if possible send for the wise urganda to cure and see to my wounds see there plague on it cried the housekeeper at this did not my heart tell the truth as to which foot my master went lame of to bed with your worship at once and we will contrive to cure you here without fetching that urgada a curse i say once more and a hundred times more on those books of chivalry that have brought your worship to such a pass they carried him to bed at once and after searching for his wounds could find none but he said they were all bruises from having had a severe fall with his horse rocinante when in combat with ten giants the biggest and the boldest to be found on earth so so said the curate are there giants in the dance by the sign of the cross i will burn them to-morrow before the day is over they put a host of questions to don quixote but his only answer to all was give him something to eat and leave him to sleep for that was what he needed most they did so and the curate questioned the peasant at great length as to how he had found don quixote he told him all and the nonsense he had talked when found and on the way home all which made the licentiate the more eager to do what he did the next day which was to summon his friend the barber master nicholas and go with him to don quixote's house end of volume one part one chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine Volume One, Part One, Chapter Six of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume One, Part One, Chapter Six of the diverting and important scrutiny which the curate and the barber made in the library of our ingenious gentleman he was still sleeping so the curate asked the niece for the keys of the room where the books the authors of all the mischief were and right willingly she gave them they all went in the housekeeper with them and found more than a hundred volumes of big books very well bound and some other small ones the moment the housekeeper saw them she turned about and ran out of the room and came back immediately with a saucer of holy water and a sprinkler saying here your worship senor licentiate sprinkle this room don't leave any magician of the many there are in these books to bewitch us in revenge for our design of banishing them from the world the simplicity of the housekeeper made the licentiate laugh and he directed the barber to give him the books one by one to see what they were about as there might be some to be found among them that did not deserve the penalty of fire no said the niece there is no reason for showing mercy to any of them they have every one of them done mischief 
better fling them out of the window into the court and make a pile of them and set fire to them or else carry them into the yard and there a bonfire can be made without the smoke giving any annoyance the housekeeper said the same so eager were they for the slaughter of those innocents but the curate would not agree to it without first reading at any rate the titles the first that master nicholas put into his hand was the four books of amidis of gaul this seems a mysterious thing said the curate for as i have heard said this was the first book of chivalry printed in spain and from this all the others derive their birth and origin so it seems to me that we ought inexorably to condemn it to the flames as the founder of so vile a sect nay sir said the barber i too have heard say that this is the best of all the books of this kind that have been written and so as something singular in its line it ought to be pardoned true said the curate and for that reason let its life be spared for the present let us see that other which is next to it it is said the barber the sergas de esplandian the lawful son of amadis of gaul then verily said the curate the merit of the father must not be put down to the account of the son take it mistress housekeeper open the window and fling it into the yard and lay the foundation of the pile for the bonfire we are to make the housekeeper obeyed with great satisfaction and the worthy esplandian went flying into the yard to await with all patience the fire that was in store for him proceed said the curate this that comes next said the barber is amadis of greece and indeed i believe all those on this side are of the same amadis lineage then to the yard with the whole of them said the curate for to have the burning of queen pintiquiniestra and the shepherd darinel in his eclogues and the bedeviled and involved discourses of his author i would burn with them the father who begot me if he were going about in the guise of a knight errant i am of the same mind said the barber and so am i added the niece in that case said the housekeeper here into the yard with them they were handed to her and as there were many of them she spared herself the staircase and flung them down out of the window who is that tub there said the curate this said the barber is don olivante de lora the author of that book said the curate was the same that wrote the garden of flowers and truly there is no deciding which of the two books is the more truthful or to put it better the less lying all i can say is send this one into the yard for a swaggering fool this that follows is flores marte of hircania said the barber senor flores marte here said the curate then by my faith he must take up his quarters in the yard in spite of his marvellous birth and visionary adventures for the stiffness and dryness of his style deserve nothing else into the yard with him and the other mistress housekeeper with all my heart senor said she and executed the order with great delight this said the barber is the knight platier an old book that said the curate but i find no reason for clemency in it send it after the others without appeal which was done another book was opened and they saw it was entitled the knight of the cross for the sake of the holy name this book has said the curate its ignorance might be excused but then they say behind the cross there is the devil to the fire with it taking down another book the barber said this is the mirror of chivalry i know his worship said the curate that is where senor reinaldos of montalvan figures with his friends and comrades greater thieves than cacus and the twelve peers of france with the voracious historian turpin however i am not for condemning them to more than perpetual banishment because at any rate they have some share in the invention of the famous matteo boyardo whence to the christian poet ludovico ariosto wove his web to whom if i find him here and speaking any language but his own i shall show no respect whatever but if he speaks his own tongue i will put him upon my head well i have him in italian said the barber but i do not understand him nor would it be well that you should understand him said the curate and on that score we might have excused the captain if he had not brought him into spain and turned him into castilian he robbed him of a great deal of his natural force and so do all those who try to turn books written in verse into another language for with all the pains they take and all the cleverness they show they never can reach the level of the originals as they were first produced in short i say that this book and all that may be found treating of those french affairs should be thrown into or deposited in some dry well until after more consideration it is settled what is to be done with them 
excepting always one bernardo de carpio that is going about another called roncevales for these if they come into my hands shall pass into those of the housekeeper and from hers into the fire without any reprieve to all this the barber gave his assent and looked upon it as right and proper being persuaded that the curate was so staunch to the faith and loyal to the truth that he would not for the world say anything opposed to them opening another book he saw it was palmerin de oliva and beside it was another called palmerin of england seeing which the licentiate said let the olive be made firewood of at once and burned until no ashes even are left and let that palm of england be kept and preserved as a thing that stands alone and let such another case be made for it as that which alexander found among the spoils of darius and set aside for the safe keeping of the words of the poet homer this book gossip is of authority for two reasons first because it is very good and secondly because it is said to have been written by a wise and witty king of portugal all the adventures at the castle of miragarda are excellent and of admirable contrivance and the language is polished and clear studying and observing the style befitting the speaker with propriety and judgment so then provided it seems good to you master nicholas i say let this and amadis of gaul be remitted the penalty of fire and as for all the rest let them perish without further question or query nay gossip said the barber for this that i have here is the famous don belianis well said the curate that and the second third and fourth parts all stand in need of a little rhubarb to purge their excess of bile and they must be cleared of all that stuff about the castle of fame and other great affectations to which end let them be allowed the overseas term and according as they mend so shall mercy or justice be meted out to them and in the meantime gossip do you keep them in your house and let no one read them with all my heart said the barber and not caring to tire himself with reading more books of chivalry he told the housekeeper to take all the big ones and throw them into the yard it was not said to one dull or deaf but to one who enjoyed burning them more than weaving the broadest and finest web that could be and seizing about eight at a time she flung them out of the window in carrying so many together she let one fall at the feet of the barber who took it up curious to know whose it was and found it said history of the famous knight tirante el blanco god bless me said the curate with a shout tirante el blanco here hand it over gossip for in it i reckon i have found a treasury of enjoyment and a mine of recreation here is don kirilizen of montalvan a valiant knight and his brother tomas of montalvan and the knight fonseca with the battle the bold tirante fought with the mastiff and the witticisms of the damsel placer de mevida and the loves and wiles of the widow reposada and the empress in love with the squire hippolito in truth gossip by right of its style it is the best book in the world here knights eat and sleep and die in their beds and make their wills before dying and a great deal more of which there is nothing in all the other books nevertheless i say he who wrote it for deliberately composing such fooleries deserves to be sent to the galleys for life take it home with you and read it and you will see that what i have said is true as you will said the barber but what are we to do with these little books that are left these must be not chivalry but poetry said the curate and opening one he saw it was the diana of jorge de montemayor and supposing all the others to be of the same sort these he said do not deserve to be burned like the others for they neither do nor can do the mischief the books of chivalry have done being books of entertainment that can hurt no one ah senor said the niece your worship had better order these to be burned as well as the others for it would be no wonder if after being cured of his chivalry disorder my uncle by reading these took a fancy to turn shepherd and range the woods and fields singing and piping or what would be still worse to turn poet which they say is an incurable and infectious malady the damsel is right said the curate and it will be well to put this stumbling block and temptation out of our friend's way to begin then with the diana of montemayor i am of opinion it should not be burned but that it should be cleared of all that about the sage felicia and the magic water and of almost all the longer pieces of verse let it keep and welcome its prose and the honor of being the first of books of the kind 
this that comes next said the barber is the diana entitled the second part by the salamancan and this other has the same title and its author is gilpolo as for that of the salamancan replied the curate let it go to swell the number of the condemned in the yard and let gilpolo's be preserved as if it came from apollo himself but get on gossip and make haste for it is growing late this book said the barber opening another is the ten books of the fortune of love written by antonio de la Frasso, a sardinian poet by the orders i have received said the curate since apollo has been apollo and the muses have been muses and poets have been poets so droll and absurd a book as this has never been written and in its way it is the best and the most singular of all of this species that have as yet appeared and he who has not read it may be sure he has never read what is delightful give it here gossip for i make more account of having found it than if they had given me a cassock of florence stuff he put it aside with extreme satisfaction and the barber went on these that come next are the shepherd of iberia the nymphs of enares and the enlightenment of jealousy then all we have to do said the curate is to hand them over to the secular arm of the housekeeper and ask me not why or we shall never have done this next is the pastor de felida no pastor that said the curate but a highly polished courtier let it be preserved as a precious jewel this large one here said the barber is called the treasury of various poems if there were not so many of them said the curate they would be more relished this book must be weeded and cleansed of certain vulgarities which it has with its excellences let it be preserved because the author is a friend of mine and out of respect for other more heroic and loftier works that he has written this continued the barber is the cancionero of lopez de montanado the author of that book too said the curate is a great friend of mine and his verses from his own mouth are the admiration of all who hear them for such is the sweetness of his voice that he enchants when he chants them it gives rather too much of its eclogues but what is good was never yet plentiful let it be kept with those that have been set apart but what book is that next to it the galatea of miguel de cervantes said the barber that cervantes has been for many years a great friend of mine and to my knowledge he has had more experience in reverses than in verses his book has some good invention in it it presents us with something but brings nothing to a conclusion we must wait for the second part it promises perhaps with amendment it may succeed in winning the full measure of grace that is now denied it and in the meantime do you send your gossip keep it shut up in your own quarters very good said the barber and here come three together the aracana of don alonso de arela the austriada of juan rufo justice of cordova and the montserrata of cristobal de verruez the valencian poet these three books said the curate are the best that have been written in castilian in heroic verse and they may compare with the most famous in italy let them be preserved as the richest treasures of poetry that spain possesses the curate was tired and would not look into any more books and so he decided that contents uncertified all the rest should be burned but just then the barber held open one called the tears of angelica i should have shed tears myself said the curate when he heard the title had i ordered that book to be burned for its author was one of the famous poets of the world not to say of spain and was very happy in the translation of some of ovid's fables end of volume one part one chapter six recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter seven of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter seven of the second sally of our worthy knight don quixote of la mancha at this instant don quixote began shouting out here here valiant knights here is need for you to put forth the might of your strong arms for they of the court are gaining the mastery in the tourney called away by this noise and outcry 
they proceeded no farther with the scrutiny of the remaining books and so it is thought that the carolea the lion of spain and the deeds of the emperor written by don luis de avila went to the fire unseen and unheard for no doubt they were among those that remained and perhaps if the curate had seen them they would not have undergone so severe a sentence when they reached don quixote he was already out of bed and was still shouting and raving and slashing and cutting all around as wide awake as if he had never slept they closed with him and by force got him back to bed and when he had become a little calm addressing the curate he said to him of a truth senor archbishop turpin it is a great disgrace for us who call ourselves the twelve peers so carelessly to allow the knights of the court to gain the victory in this tourney we the adventurers having carried off the honour on the three former days hush gossip said the curate please god the luck may turn and what is lost to-day may be won to-morrow for the present let your worship have a care of your health for it seems to me that you are over fatigued if not badly wounded wounded no said don quixote but bruised and battered no doubt for that bastard don roland has cudgelled me with the trunk of an oak tree and all for envy because he sees that i alone rival him in his achievements but i should not call myself reynaldos of montovan did he not pay me for it in spite of all his enchantments as soon as i rise from this bed for the present let them bring me something to eat for that i feel is what will be more to my purpose and leave it to me to avenge myself they did as he wished they gave him something to eat and once more he fell asleep leaving them marvelling at his madness that night the housekeeper burned to ashes all the books that were in the yard and in the whole house and some must have been consumed that deserved preservation in everlasting archives but their fate and the laziness of the examiner did not permit it and so in them was verified the proverb that sometimes the innocent suffer for the guilty one of the remedies which the curate and the barber immediately applied to their friend's disorder was to wall up and plaster the room where the books were so that when he got up he should not find them possibly the cause being removed the effect might cease and they might say that a magician had carried them off room and all and this was done with all dispatch two days later don quixote got up and the first thing he did was to go and look at his books and not finding the room where he had left it he wandered from side to side looking for it he came to the place where the door used to be and tried it with his hands and turned and twisted his eyes in every direction without saying a word but after a good while he asked his housekeeper whereabouts was the room that held his books the housekeeper who had been already well instructed in what she was to answer said what room or what nothing is it that your worship is looking for there are neither room nor books in this house now for the devil himself is carried all away it was not the devil said the niece but a magician who came on a cloud one night after the day your worship left this and dismounting from a serpent that he rode he entered the room and what he did there i know not but after a little while he made off flying through the roof and left the house full of smoke and when we went to see what he had done we saw neither book nor room but we remember very well the housekeeper and i that on leaving the old villain said in a loud voice that for a private grudge he owed the owner of the books in the room he had done mischief in that house that would be discovered by and by he said too that his name was the sage munyaton he must have said freestone said don quixote i don't know whether he called himself freestone or friton said the housekeeper i only know that his name ended with ton so it does said don quixote and he is a sage magician a great enemy of mine who has a spite against me because he knows by his arts and lore that in process of time i am to engage in single combat with a knight whom he befriends and that i am to conquer and he will be unable to prevent it and for this reason he endeavours to do me all the ill turns that he can but i promise him it will be hard for him to oppose or avoid what is decreed by heaven who doubts that said the niece but uncle who mixes you up in these quarrels would it not be better to remain at peace in your own house instead of roaming the world looking for better bread than ever came of wheat never reflecting that many go for wool and come back shorn o oh, niece of mine replied don quixote how much astray art thou in thy reckoning 
ere they shear me i shall have plucked away and stripped off the beards of all who would dare to touch only the tip of a hair of mine the two were unwilling to make any further answer as they saw that his anger was kindling in short then he remained at home fifteen days very quietly without showing any signs of a desire to take up with his former delusions and during this time he held lively discussions with his two gossips the curate and the barber on the point he maintained that knights errant were what the world stood most in need of and that in him was to be accomplished the revival of knight errantry the curate sometimes contradicted him sometimes agreed with him for if he had not observed this precaution he would have been unable to bring him to reason meanwhile don quixote worked upon a farm laborer a neighbor of his an honest man if indeed that title can be given to him who is poor but with very little wit in his pate in a word he so talked him over and with such persuasions and promises that the poor clown made up his mind to sally forth with him and serve him as esquire don quixote among other things told him he ought to be ready to go with him gladly because any moment an adventure might occur that might win an island in the twinkling of an eye and leave him governor of it on these and the like promises sancho panza for so the laborer was called left wife and children and engaged himself as esquire to his neighbor don quixote next set about getting some money and selling one thing and pawning another and making a bad bargain in every case he got together a fair sum he provided himself with a buckler which he begged as a loan from a friend and restoring his battered helmet as best he could he warned his squire sancho of the day and hour he meant to set out that he might provide himself with what he thought most needful above all he charged him to take alforjas with him the other said he would and that he meant to take also a very good ass he had as he was not much given to going on foot about the ass don quixote hesitated a little trying whether he could call to mind any knight-errant taking with him an esquire mounted on ass-back but no instance occurred to his memory for all that however he determined to take him intending to furnish him with a more honourable mount when a chance of it presented itself by appropriating the horse of the first discourteous knight he encountered himself he provided with shirts and such other things as he could according to the advice the host had given him all which being settled and done without taking leave sancho panza of his wife and children or don quixote of his housekeeper and niece they sallied forth unseen by anybody from the village one night and made such good way in the course of it that by daylight they held themselves safe from discovery even should search be made for them sancho rode on his ass like a patriarch with his alforjas and bota and longing to see himself soon governor of the island his master had promised him don quixote decided upon taking the same route and road he had taken on his first journey that over the campo de montiel which he had travelled with less discomfort than on the last occasion for as it was early morning and the rays of the sun fell on them obliquely the heat did not distress them and now said sancho panza to his master your worship will take care senor knight-errant not to forget about the island you have promised me for be it ever so big i'll be equal to governing it to which don quixote replied thou must know friend sancho panza that it was a practice very much in vogue with the knights errant of old to make their squires governors of the islands or kingdoms they won and i am determined that there shall be no failure on my part in so liberal a custom on the contrary i mean to improve upon it for they sometimes and perhaps most frequently waited until their squires were old and then when they had had enough of service and hard days and worse nights they gave them some title or other or count or at the most marquis of some valley or province more or less but if thou livest and i live it may well be that before six days are over i may have won some kingdom that has others dependent upon it which will be just the thing to enable thee to be crowned king of one of them nor needst thou count this wonderful for things and chances fall to the lot of such knights in ways so unexampled and unexpected that i might easily give thee even more than i promise thee 
in that case said sancho panza if i should become a king by one of those miracles your worship speaks of even juana gutierrez my old woman would come to be queen and my children infantes well who doubts it said don quixote i doubt it replied sancho panza because for my part i am persuaded that though god should shower down kingdoms upon earth not one of them would fit the head of mari gutierrez let me tell you senor she is not worth two maravedis for a queen countess will fit her better and that only with god's help leave it to god sancho returned don quixote for he will give her what suits her best but do not undervalue thyself so much as to come to be content with anything less than being governor of a province i will not senor answered sancho especially as i have a man of such quality for a master in your worship who will be able to give me all that will be suitable for me and that i can bear end of volume one part one chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter eight of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume one part one chapter eight of the good fortune which the valiant don quixote had in the terrible and undreamt of adventure of the windmills with other occurrences worthy to be fitly recorded at this point they came in sight of thirty or forty windmills that there are on that plain and as soon as don quixote saw them he said to his squire fortune is arranging matters for us better than we could have shaped our desires ourselves for look there friend sancho panza where thirty or more monstrous giants present themselves all of whom i mean to engage in battle and slay and with whose spoils we shall begin to make our fortunes for this is righteous warfare and it is god's good service to sweep so evil a breed from off the face of the earth what giants said sancho panza those thou seest there answered his master with the long arms and some of them nearly two leagues long look your worship said sancho what we see there are not giants but windmills and what seem to be their arms are the sails that turned by the wind make the millstone go it is easy to see replied don quixote that thou art not used to this business of adventures those are giants and if thou art afraid away with thee out of this and betake thyself to prayer while i engage them in fierce and unequal combat so saying he gave the spur to his steed rocinante heedless of the cries his squire sancho sent after him warning him that most certainly they were windmills and not giants he was going to attack he however was so positive they were giants that he neither heard the cries of sancho nor perceived near as he was what they were but made at them shouting fly not cowards and vile beings for it is a single knight that attacks you a slight breeze at this moment sprang up and the great sails began to move seeing which don quixote exclaimed though ye flourish more arms than the giant briarius ye have yet to reckon with me so saying and commending himself with all his heart to his lady dulcinea imploring her to support him in such a peril with lance in rest and covered by his buckler he charged at rocinante's fullest gallop and fell upon the first mill that stood in front of him but as he drove his lance point into the sail the wind whirled it round with such force that it shivered the lance to pieces sweeping with it horse and rider who went rolling over on the plain in a sorry condition sancho hastened to his assistance as fast as his ass could go and when he came up found him unable to move with such a shock had rocinante fallen with him god bless me said sancho did i not tell your worship to mind what you were about for they were only windmills and no one could have made any mistake about it but one who had something of the same kind in his head hush friend sancho replied don quixote the fortunes of war more than any other are liable to frequent fluctuations and moreover i think and it is the truth that the same sage friston who carried off my study and books has turned these giants into mills in order to rob me of the glory of vanquishing them such is the enmity he bears me but in the end his wicked arts will avail but little against my good sword 
god order it as he may said sancho panzo and helping him to rise got him up again on rocinante whose shoulder was half out and then discussing the late adventure they followed the road to puerto la pice for there said don quixote they could not fail to find adventures in abundance and variety as it was a great thoroughfare for all that he was much grieved at the loss of his lance and saying so to his squire he added i remember having read how a spanish knight diego perez de vargas by name having broken his sword in battle tore from an oak a ponderous bough or branch and with it did such things that day and pounded so many moors that he got the surname of machuea and he and his descendants from that day forth were called vargas y machuea i mention this because from the first oak i see i mean to rend such another branch large and stout like that with which i am determined and resolved to do such deeds that thou mayest deem thyself very fortunate in being found worthy to come and see them and be an eye-witness of things that will with difficulty be believed be that as god will said sancho i believe it all as your worship says it but straighten yourself a little for you seem all on one side maybe from the shaking of the fall that is the truth said don quixote and if i make no complaint of the pain it is because knights errant are not permitted to complain of any wound even though their bowels be coming out through it if so said sancho i have nothing to say but god knows i would rather your worship complained when anything ailed you for my part i confess i must complain however small the ache may be unless indeed this rule about not complaining extends to the squires of knights errant also don quixote could not help laughing at his squire's simplicity and he assured him he might complain whenever and however he chose just as he liked for so far he had never read of anything to the contrary in the order of knighthood sancho bade him remember it was dinner-time to which his master answered that he wanted nothing himself just then but that he might eat when he had a mind with this permission sancho settled himself as comfortably as he could on his beast and taking out of the alforjas what he had stowed away in them he jogged along behind his master munching deliberately and from time to time taking a pull at the bota with a relish that the thirstiest tapster in malaga might have envied and while he went on in this way gulping down draught after draught he never gave a thought to any of the promises his master had made him nor did he rate it as hardship but rather as recreation going in quest of adventures however dangerous they might be finally they passed the night among some trees from one of which don quixote plucked a dry branch to serve him after a fashion as a lance and fixed on it the head he had removed from the broken one all that night don quixote lay awake thinking of his lady dulcinea in order to conform to what he had read in his books how many a night in the forests and deserts knights used to lie sleepless supported by the memory of their mistresses not so did sancho panza spend it for having his stomach full of something stronger than chicory water he made but one sleep of it and if his master had not called him neither the rays of the sun beating on his face nor all the cheery notes of the birds welcoming the approach of day would have had power to waken him on getting up he tried the bota and found it somewhat less full than the night before which grieved his heart because they did not seem to be on the way to remedy the deficiency readily don quixote did not care to break his fast for as has been already said he confined himself to savoury recollections for nourishment they returned to the road they had set out with leading to puerto la pice and at three in the afternoon they came in sight of it here brother sancho panza said don quixote when he saw it we may plunge our hands up to the elbows in what they call adventures but observe even shouldst thou see me in the greatest danger in the world thou must not put a hand to thy sword in my defence unless indeed thou perceivest that those who assail me are rabble or base folk for in that case thou mayest very properly aid me but if they be knights it is on no account permitted or allowed thee by the laws of knighthood to help me until thou hast been dubbed a knight most certainly senor replied sancho your worship shall be fully obeyed in this matter all the more as of myself i am peaceful and no friend to mixing in strife and quarrels it is true that as regards the defence of my own person i shall not give much heed to those laws for laws human and divine allow each one to defend himself against any assailant whatever that i grant said don quixote 
but in this matter of aiding me against knights thou must put a restraint upon thy natural impetuosity i will do so i promise you answered sancho and i will keep this precept as carefully as sunday while they were thus talking there appeared on the road two friars of the order of saint benedict mounted on two dromedaries for not less tall were the two mules they rode on they wore travelling spectacles and carried sunshades and behind them came a coach attended by four or five persons on horseback and two muleteers on foot in the coach there was as afterwards appeared a biscay lady on her way to seville where her husband was about to take passage for the indies with an appointment of high honour the friars though going the same road were not in her company but the moment don quixote perceived them he said to his squire either i am mistaken or this is going to be the most famous adventure that has ever been seen for those black bodies we see there must be and doubtless are magicians who are carrying off some stolen princess in that coach and with all my might i must undo this wrong this will be worse than the windmills said sancho look senor those are friars of saint benedict and the coach plainly belongs to some travellers mind i tell you to mind well what you are about and don't let the devil mislead you i have told thee already sancho replied don quixote that on the subject of adventures thou knowest little what i say is the truth as thou shalt see presently so saying he advanced and posted himself in the middle of the road along which the friars were coming and as soon as he thought they had come near enough to hear what he said he cried aloud devilish and unnatural beings release instantly the high-born princesses whom you are carrying off by force in this coach else prepare to meet a speedy death as the just punishment of your evil deeds the friars drew rein and stood wondering at the appearance of don quixote as well as at his words to which they replied senor caballero we are not devilish or unnatural but two brothers of saint benedict following our road nor do we know whether or not there are any captive princesses coming in this coach no soft words with me for i know you lying rabble said don quixote and without waiting for a reply he spurred rocinante and with levelled lance charged the first friar with such fury and determination that if the friar had not flung himself off the mule he would have brought him to the ground against his will and sore wounded if not killed outright the second brother seeing how his comrade was treated drove his heels into his castle of a mule and made off across the country faster than the wind sancho panza when he saw the friar on the ground dismounting briskly from his ass rushed towards him and began to strip off his gown at that instant the friar's muleteers came up and asked what he was stripping him for sancho answered them that this fell to him lawfully as spoil of the battle which his lord don quixote had won the muleteers who had no idea of a joke and did not understand all this about battles and spoils seeing that don quixote was some distance off talking to the travellers in the coach fell upon sancho knocked him down and leaving hardly a hair in his beard belaboured him with kicks and left him stretched breathless and senseless on the ground and without any more delay helped the friar to mount who trembling terrified and pale as soon as he found himself in the saddle spurred after his companion who was standing at a distance looking on watching the result of the onslaught then not caring to wait for the end of the affair just begun they pursued their journey making more crosses than if they had the devil after them don quixote was as has been said speaking to the lady in the coach your beauty lady mine said he may now dispose of your person as may be most in accordance with your pleasure for the pride of your ravishers lies prostrate on the ground through this strong arm of mine unless you should be pining to know the name of your deliverer know that i am called don quixote of la mancha knight-errant and adventurer and captive to the peerless and beautiful lady dulcinea del toboso and in return for the service you have received of me i ask no more than that you should return to el toboso and on my behalf present yourself before that lady and tell her what i have done to set you free one of the squires in attendance upon the coach a biscayan was listening to all don quixote was saying and perceiving that he would not allow the coach to go on but was saying it must return at once to el toboso he made at him and seizing his lance addressed him in bad castilian and worse biscayan after this fashion begone caballero and ill go with thee 
by the god that made me unless thou quittest coach slayest thou as art here a biscayan don quixote understood him quite well and answered him very quietly if thou wert a knight as thou art none i should have already chastised thy folly and rashness miserable creature to which the biscayan returned i know gentleman i swear to god thou liest as i am christian if thou droppest lance and drawest sword soon shalt thou see thou art carrying water to the cat biscayan on land hidalgo at sea hidalgo at the devil and look if thou sayest otherwise thou liest you will see presently said agrajes replied don quixote and throwing his lance on the ground he drew his sword braced his buckler on his arm and attacked the biscayan bent upon taking his life the biscayan when he saw him coming on though he wished to dismount from his mule in which being one of those sorry ones let out for hire he had no confidence had no choice but to draw his sword it was lucky for him however that he was near the coach from which he was able to snatch a cushion that served him for a shield and then they went at one another as if they had been two mortal enemies the others strove to make peace between them but could not for the biscayan declared in his disjointed phrase that if they did not let him finish his battle he would kill his mistress and every one that strove to prevent him the lady in the coach amazed and terrified at what she saw ordered the coachman to draw aside a little and set herself to watch this severe struggle in the course of which the biscayan smote don quixote a mighty stroke on the shoulder over the top of his buckler which given to one without armor would have cleft him to the waist don quixote feeling the weight of this prodigious blow cried aloud saying o lady of my soul dulcinea flower of beauty come to the aid of this your knight who in fulfilling his obligations to your beauty finds himself in this extreme peril to say this to lift his sword to shelter himself well behind his buckler and to assail the biscayan was the work of an instant determined as he was to venture all upon a single blow the biscayan seeing him come on in this way was convinced of his courage by his spirited bearing and resolved to follow his example so he waited for him keeping well under cover of his cushion being unable to execute any sort of manoeuvre with his mule which dead tired and never meant for this kind of game could not stir a step on then as aforesaid came don quixote against the wary biscayan with uplifted sword and a firm intention of splitting him in half while on his side the biscayan waited for him sword in hand and under the protection of his cushion and all present stood trembling waiting in suspense the result of blows such as threatened to fall and the lady in the coach and the rest of her following were making a thousand vows and offerings to all the images and shrines of spain that god might deliver her squire and all of them from this great peril in which they found themselves but it spoils all that at this point and crisis the author of the history leaves this battle impending giving as excuse that he could find nothing more written about these achievements of don quixote than what has been already set forth it is true the second author of this work was unwilling to believe that a history so curious could have been allowed to fall under the sentence of oblivion or that the wits of la mancha could have been so undiscerning as not to preserve in their archives or registries some documents referring to this famous knight and this being his persuasion he did not despair of finding the conclusion of this pleasant history which heaven favoring him he did find in a way that shall be related in the second part End of Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 8 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine